This year, I've decided to do my 2024 previews a bit differently, and that's by studio. Ooh, you're gonna love this. And we're starting out with Warner Brothers Discovery, which is set to potentially have a banner year in 2024 in more ways than one. And at the heart of it is, of course, Zazzy. Ooh, Zazzy, what kind of year is he going to have? Will it be more controversial headlines? Triumph? or Zazzy laughing all the way to the bank as he sells Warner Brothers. I suspect it'll be a combination of all three. So yes, it's long been suspected that David Zaslov has no long-term interest in Warner Brothers and is instead flipping it like a house. He came in, he fixed it up, he wants to get a good price for it uh, and make even more money off of it. And so would AT&T, by the way, who, uh, with many of the executives still substantial shareholders in the new company. And David Zaslov can start selling it in April 2024, uh, April of this year. That's the agreement that he made when he acquired Warner Brothers in the first place. It, they, I think because they knew he probably wanted to flip it and they said he had to at least wait until, again, April 2024. The reason he tipped his hand a little bit early, uh, I mean, again, we've been discussing it, but Zaslav himself made it kind of clear when he went after or had exploratory meetings with Paramount and started kicking the tires over there because David Ellison, uh, Larry Ellison's son, who, who's behind Skydance, he uh, has some financial partners and he's trying to do a takeover via stock, uh, whereas David Zaslav would enter into an agreement with Sherry Redstone and company. Although, of course, the, you know, the stock would be a part of it. But, you know, one is talking to Sherry, one's just taking the stock. All right, so anyway, one option, of course, is to sell Warner Brothers as it is right now, not go after Paramount, to Comcast, which we've long, long suspected. Uh, also, a tech giant like Apple or Amazon could come in. Amazon, of course, already has MGM, but these days, the name of the game in Hollywood is to be a behemoth. So Amazon could use even more. MGM was, you know, a, 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 an appetizer, you could say. And then also, you never know, another buyer could pop out of nowhere. Like Ellison. Nobody thought Ellison wanted to buy a studio, yet here he is. So Zazzy, though, is concerned that Warner Brothers, I just said the name of the game is to be, is to be as big as possible. And I think Zazzy feels Warner Brothers might still be too small, probably because he doesn't want to sell to Scope. Does, does, does Zazzy want to sell Discovery too and parachute out of there? Maybe, with Discovery kind of being the National Geographic of the Disney Fox situation, right? Uh, and that's and the reason Zazzy wants to merge Warner Brothers and Paramount is to compete with the likes of Netflix and now Disney. And the whole reason Disney got so big was to compete with Netflix. So that's again why Zazzy is thinking of merging the companies to sell the combined one. Uh, now, as I said, this would be a merger. That's very important to focus on. Uh, Disney acquired Fox, and the Murdochs kept a number of assets, huge assets, like the Fox Network and uh, Fox Cable News Channels, Wall Street Journal, etc. Uh, so, so Paramount wouldn't get swallowed up like that, uh, although I'm not saying it wouldn't get chopped up. I think Zazzy might do that. But Zazzy at first would, again, merge the two companies. And that would be a delicate endeavor because there's a lot of duplicates, not only with product like Max and Paramount Plus, uh, CNN and CBS uh, News, HBO Showtime, uh, but then there are overlaps in departments as well. You would have two film divisions, two, publi two publicity departments, and that would need to be settled up. You would think the government might step in and say this was a monopoly, but if they haven't stepped in so far, what's going to make them step in going forward? Uh, so we'll see what happens. Because a lot of jobs would be lost in such a merger, as we saw with the Disney Fox situation. Uh, then Zazzy can sell the whole pie to one very hungry company with a big appetite, or he can slice it up into smaller bites and sell those. Uh, you know, I think the bulk of it will go to somebody, but I do think a couple of things might be spun off and sold. Uh, even, even, maybe even with Paramount, you know, there's already been bids to just take BET and remove it from that merger. Uh, Byron Allen has been interested in just acquiring BET. Uh, so Zazzy also has already shown a willingness to, you know, you know, no matter what people might say about legacy, uh, Zazzy doesn't have a, an issue with that. Uh, he feels nothing is too sacred to make a buck off of because he's been renting out Warner Brothers movies and TV shows to other streaming services as we speak, like Netflix for cash and Amazon's doing the Batman animated series instead of that appearing on Max. That's crazy, but it's happening.
Now, I don't think Zazu would sell DC. I think it's too valuable. Uh, but I think you could see him selling off some IP, particularly if he gets his hands on Paramounts, because some of those are smaller. Remember, with Paramount, what really makes that deal attractive to Zazu, besides just the scope of it and, and enlarging Warner Brothers' assets, is Nickelodeon. Because Warner Brothers Discovery, as of right now, does not have uh, ch a children's entertainment division. Uh, they have Cartoon Network, but that's become a lot more adult over the years. Uh, so I think Nickelodeon, that makes it very, very valuable. Especially if streaming services these days are seen as babysitting services, right? What's the most popular show on Disney Plus often? Bluey. Uh, so, you know, Zazie needs some of that, uh, you know, sweet, sweet children's entertainment. Uh, and Nickelodeon, of course, delivers that in spades. SpongeBob's still popular to this day. Warner Brothers, by the way, also has a gaming division. And with very few studios, I don't think any other studios these days are directly involved in the video game business. You know, whoever is purchasing Warner Brothers Discovery might not want to also, you know, they might not be interested in that. So that's something else that I could see potentially being spun off and sold. It could be sold uh, to a giant within the gaming world. You know, there's a lot of potential buyers like Microsoft. Uh, but, you know, that would keep... Uh, so and also that, to make that part of that package very attractive, they could say, we'll let you keep the IP contracts for Warner Brothers and you can continue to make games for our brands. That would be very attractive to, you know, especially because video games have become, you know, streaming, they're very much becoming streaming services as well with people buying passes and what's a PlayStation exclusive, what's an Xbox exclu exclusive, get some DC games in the mix. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, some IP, which is uh, unique to those companies at the, in the Warner Brothers gaming division, like Mortal Kombat, and that would probably up the price as well. And the Warner Brothers could still ha keep a contract to make movies and, you know, animation off of that. Uh, you know, you could, again, it would still be lucrative, but Warner Brothers would never, would, wouldn't own it anymore. But the relationship could still potentially exist, at least for a little bit. And then, of course, it would eventually be negotiated to the highest bidder. All right, so that's what's going on in the executive suite. Woo, pretty spicy stuff. Now let's take a look at the movies. Yeah, that's right, they're releasing some movies uh, in 2024. They have about 14 films set. You know, you never know these days, particularly with Zazzy. Uh, and as much as I think we like to complain about Warner Brothers, uh, you know, with some of the decisions executives are making, etc., they still continue to have a really interesting and bold slate. I mean, I think they're fantastic. They really do. You know, Universal's trying to step in there, but I really do still feel that, still feel that Warner Brothers balances out Disney. And they have some really cool stuff coming out this year, and I'm excited to talk to you about it. So let's start with the established IP. So while DC takes the year off preparing for James Gunn's softish reboot with Superman Legacy in 2025, oh boy, I hope that's good, they still have a DC Elseworlds movie this year with Joker Folie à deux. You know, I like that title. I think it's brilliant, actually. But I think Joker 2 might be a little bit more commercial. But does Joker 2 want to be commercial? The first one struck just the right balance between awards film and blockbuster. Uh, but, you know, there are a couple of hurdles. You would think this would be a slam dunk, although it's tough to make a sequel to a movie like that. But there are a couple other hurdles besides just the creative process. So there's this, Matt Reeves' uh, Batman movies, and then Gunn's supposed upcoming Brave and the Bold. Wouldn't it be great if Gunn was like, psych! You know, I don't know how many teases and Mr. X we can take as a fandom, but I would forgive it if they were still somehow going to loop in Matt Reeves' The Batman to the Gunverse. But... As is, based on what we've been told, there are going to be three different Batman timelines going at once. And uh, we'll, we'll see if that works out. Harley Quinn, of course, has been huge for DC and Warner Brothers. But let's see if the character can survive switching actors and tone. Margot Robbie, Robbie though, has been extremely gracious as of late about the switch. And I think that's awesome. Uh, if, the, if she and Lady Gaga could make some appearances together, I think that would be really, really nice to do. Uh, Margot Robbie, you know, of course, Lady Gaga kind of stabbed her in the back a little bit because Margot Robbie, of course, wanted Lady Gaga to be in Birds of Prey. But Margot Robbie is so successful with Barbie now, both, you know, career-wise, and she made so much money off of the film. I'm sure it's all, it's all smiles and happiness. So uh, that would be great to see. And also, though, while Lady Gaga's version actually, to me, seems more loyal to the original animated Harley, that's not the version that most people are familiar with, you know, whether you like it or not. 
Most people know the candy-colored girl power version that Margot Robbie made so well known through her films. And but which, by the way, never really particularly did well. The first Suicide Squad movie did well, but you know none of the Margot Robbie Harley Quinn outings after that really did that well, interestingly enough. Uh, even the animated series, I'm glad it keeps getting renewed, but it's not huge. So it's a, it's a weird space to be in where the character is super popular with some people, but yet, you know, I think she has, she has fantastic name recognition. I think she's certainly the most famous, you know, she surpassed Wonder Woman, I think, as the most well-known DC female character. But getting people to pay to see her has been another story. Uh, also, well, and I still try and buy her comic, though, even though it's been really bad for a while. I do love that animated series, though. Also, while a lot of us love Lady Gaga, myself included, House of Gucci was a really surprising misfire. I'm not surprised the movie wasn't, I mean, the movie wasn't great, but I'm surprised so many people did not give Lady Gaga her flowers for her, her work. I mean, the movie really took a turn for the worse when it no longer focused on her. I thought she was incredible in it, and she just really didn't get any appreciation for the work that she did there, even though the movie itself might not have worked. So could we be surprised like that again with her Lady Gaga, even though right now it seems incredible? I mean, women have to like it, the LGBT community has to like it, and I think they've got us sewed up. But how about, you know, guys, which, you know, again, lo 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 like, whether you like it or not, you know, guys still make up the bulk of the comic book audience, so they have to like it as well. Uh, oh, I hope this is good too. A lot of hope. I'm going to go into 2024 hopeful and optimistic and then deal with the harsh reality if it shows up. Uh, and then, speaking of the circumstances of Hollywood right now, with Hollywood leading perhaps a bit too uh, hard into feminist girl power stories across the board, everyone decided to do it at once. Uh, can Joker share his movie with Harley Quinn successfully? Emphasis on share. From what I hear, she is not she is not his sidekick in this movie. It is very much a two-hander. It's very much and that well, that's all I want to say. But you know, I have my concerns. Uh, the first movie though did make a billion dollars and won two Oscars, including Best Actor for Joaquin Phoenix. That's a big one. That's a big Oscar. Joker 2 is also following the first film's release strategy with the first weekend of October. Historically, that's been a great release date for many a movie, but it was really blown up to a blockbuster release date with uh, Ven the first Venom and Joker. So now it's a, it's a very good date. So Joker 2 is very well positioned if Todd Phillips, uh, uh, and particularly Todd Phillips and um, uh, Lady Gaga can deliver. All right, then with more, re I'm so nervous about that movie. All right, then with more recent IP, Warner Brothers is bringing back Godzilla and Kong together again, baby. Uh, this time working together, they love each other now. Uh, and another chapter of Dune. Dune! All right, Dune is really well positioned to open after a long, dry spell of blockbusters. It's first up, baby. You know, maybe audiences will be a little less picky when they're just, you know, dying from blockbuster thirst. And not even the streaming services are really stepping up with anything. So it's just, it's just a wasteland of entertainment across the board. So here comes Dune, which, by the way, takes place in a desert wasteland. Hilarious. And March, by the way, is already a strong uh, month for movies because it coincides with spring break. Denis Villeneuve has said that Warner Brothers was only willing to commit to two Dune movies. So if you want to see more, you best be seeing this one in theaters. And luckily, it very much lends itself to the premium theater experience. So if, you, if you're interested in Dune, you're going to want to see it in theaters. And Timothy Chalamet is coming off of Wonka, also for Warner Brothers, which was very strong at the box office. And now you won't be Timothy Chalamet out. Uh, let's, I think whenever they release Wonka on digital, they should be very careful about that to make sure it's not too close to Dune. Dune 2. Uh, but yeah, Timothy Chalamet is turning out to be a great investment for Warner Brothers. And so maybe th this will continue and he'll have two franchises at the studio. Also, they promise us that this time Zendaya is actually in the movie. Uh, then with Godzilla and Kong, Godzilla x Kong, will Adam Wingard be able to deliver again? And will audiences still be interested in a more cartoonish take on Godzilla after the more serious Godzilla Minus One from Toho itself? You know, that one only made about $50 million domestic, but it really got a grip on the fandom, you know, particularly the Godzilla fandom. And so I'm curious to see if that maybe might undercut this new movie just a, just a scooch. Because this one is like super silly. Uh, the MonsterVerse, though, is a, is a difficult IP to get right overall because the new show on Apple TV hasn't really connected, despite being quite good. 
Uh, I preferred their mid-April release date that they had. They just moved it off of that because they moved Mickey 17. They, well, Mickey 17 now doesn't have a release date, so they took that and they gave it to Godzilla X Kong. But here's why I liked the mid-April date. Because sometimes that's when the summer movie season has historically started. Fast and Furious and Marvel have both kicked off the summer early in mid to late April, getting out ahead of the, the first weekend of May, which is you know, the official start of the summer movie season. But it can be done in mid-April. And with uh, Deadpool 3 being forced to move due to the strikes and Universal's The Fall Guy stepping into that May uh, first weekend of May release date instead, I think that Godzilla X Kong is more of a summer kickoff movie, and it might have been able to, to do that. Maybe they feel they still can at the very end of March. It's only been moved up about like two weeks or so, and this way they can play all the way through April until the fall guy arrives. I don't know. It seems a little bit too early to me, but I guess it's still also you got the spring break factor in there still. Maybe. Maybe. But I liked their mid-April release date a little bit better. Then, I mean, let's see. I mean, it might be, doesn't matter when that movie opens. I don't know. It looked, it looked silly to me, but some of you really liked it, so that's promising. Then, of course, there's Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. Is Mad Max a franchise? Is it a brand that can be expanded, particularly without Tom Hardy or Charlize Theron? I mean, I guess it's got George Miller, right? He's supposed to be the brand, but he's not been able to build himself up like into a Nolan, but maybe he's trying. He's going to have to be a little bit more prolific if he would like to. Uh, Theron has been replaced by Anya Taylor-Joy and an unrecognizable Chris Hemsworth uh, coming in for Hardy. Hemsworth, even when you can tell who he is, has struggled at the box office outside of Marvel. Only his extraction uh, movies on Netflix have really worked out for him. And Taylor Joy has also struggled at the box office, but maybe this is the movie breakout for her, just like The Queen's Gambit was her streaming breakout. Although she couldn't capitalize on that, which I found surprising. The trailer didn't quite hit, which has made me the most nervous, and I think everyone is wondering where Charlize Theron is, who originated the role of Furiosa and is still in shape to play her. Uh, that could come back and really get that movie, which is, a, you know, it's not, it's not Anya Taylor-Joy's fault, but I hope she doesn't suffer because of it. Then uh, we've got blasts from the past. Uh, Hollywood is not done with nostalgia, largely because you aren't done with nostalgia. Some of this stuff still does pretty well, and some of this could do well. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice 2. As I recently said, this is not only a sequel to Beetlejuice, but a de facto one for Wednesday, uh, which has also had its second season delayed because of the strikes, writers, writing and acting. So this will keep Wednesday to some degree in the public eye. Uh, we'll see, and it will really test Jenna Ortega's star power. Uh, I hope it doesn't hurt Wednesday by overexposing. I mean, if it doesn't go well, I think it would potentially hurt Wednesday season two. Let's see. And while Michael Keaton is already on a bit of a comeback tour, Beetlejuice has always been one of his more unique roles. I recently rewatched the movie, and, uh, you know, Beetlejuice has a sense of humor that I don't know would work today. I think Beetlejuice would maybe find himself canceled, or at least severely reprimanded. So I'm curious to see how they're going to make the, the, that character work in 2024. Uh, then, while The Lord of the Rings has been in the public eye recently, thanks to the Prime Video series, and again, some damage was done to the brand there, I think, Warner Brothers is now returning to Middle Earth, one of the first billion dollar blockbuster franchises that also was big at the Oscars. It won Best Frickin' Picture. A blockbuster won Best Picture. That's incredible, incredible stuff. But then Warner Brothers stayed a little bit too long at the party with those Hobbit movies. They still made bank, but I think they also, you know, as Hollywood always does, they tend to try and they tend to run stuff into the ground. You know, they can't tell when the party's over. Uh, but, you know, they, they're pretty good at getting the party back up again. But I'm very excited about this new movie because it's going to be animated. Oh, I'm so excited about this. Uh, after Sony's success uh, animating Spider-Man, can Warner Brothers find the same level of success with The Lord of the Rings? But here's where it gets even more interesting. Because, I mean, at the very least, this movie will excite genre fans and do only okay at the box office before really doing well on digital and max. I'll take it, but my dream for this animated Lord of the Rings movie is to do well at the box office because I want to see animation for adult audiences in the West continue to grow because the Spider-Verse movie was for everybody. Sure, adults really liked it, but it was really good for families. But the Lord of the Rings is not a family franchise, at least if they do this movie right. And so this is going to be very much an animated movie from a big Hollywood studio that is just for adults. And the fact that that's even happening just shows such a growth 
growth for animation uh, in the West, that it's very, very exciting. But for this growth to continue, this, these things have to succeed. So that I'm very, very excited though. I think this could be fantastic. Oh, I'm so excited. All right, and then of course, Warner Brothers is known for their horror division. So successful that its head, Walter Hamada, got promoted to the head of DC as a reward. But then it turned into a nightmare. Oh, that really did not work out. But one of Hamada's horror finds was screenwriter Gary Doberman, who is still at the studio. Uh, Hamada is not. I believe he now, oh, by the way, I think his deal is a paramount. That's hilarious. He might be like, I can't believe I got pulled back into Warner Brothers if, this de if that deal works out. But maybe he can also go around there and whisper, you know, maybe, maybe he's a sleeper agent. You never know. Walter Hamada does like to pick up the phone and call people. All right. So uh, in 2024, Doberman will supposedly, do well, he's going to make it, I think. His, uh, he's supposed to. His second horror movie for Warner Brothers, directing. Uh, Salem's Lot, where he's jumping from the Conjuring universe to Stephen King. Uh, audiences love Stephen King and they love vampires. So this could do very, very well. This movie, though, still doesn't have a release date, so it might not make the cut for 2024. Next, it's no secret that it was a major blow to Warner Brothers when they lost Christopher Nolan. And not only has he made bank a Universal, but Universal is finally winning him awards, something that Warner Brothers was never able to do. So even though Warner Brothers themselves cut him a really big check to make up for Tenet, I think it's unlikely that he's coming back. So Warner Brothers must move on and forge new relationships. You know, it's interesting because back in the day under Jeff Romanov, who had wanted to head up Warner Brothers but left when Kevin Sujihara got the job, they should have picked Romanov. But Warner Brothers was known for its relationship with filmmakers and they've lost that since Romanov's departure. And now though, they're trying to get it back. It didn't go so well when they stuck everybody's movies on max day and date either. Although everybody was, every studio was having a tough time during the pandemic, but that really, that really hurt. <clears throat> and they, and Warner Brothers has a number of named talents set for 2024. Could these be the beginnings of some beautiful friendships? A uh, side note, by the way, Warner Brothers, David Zaslav in particular, just became BFFs with Tom Cruise. Although oddly, Cruise's dance card is still pretty locked down for the foreseeable future back at Paramount. Perhaps Zazzy is simply working to cement the Paramount Warner Brothers merger by creating a strong connection and saying, hey, Tom Cruise loves us both, baby. And Warner Brothers has also recently landed Paul Thomas Anderson with Leonardo DiCaprio starring. DiCaprio making quite a number of movies back in the day under Robinov. But that's also huge for the studio. All right, back to 2024 though. Who's set to 20 for 2024? Kevin Costner. Oh, I like this one. This is great. Kevin Costner, still hurting from his breakup with Yellowstone and also in his personal life, a nasty divorce. He is returning to the director's chair for a two-part Western. In fact, he would like this to eventually be a four-part Western as Costner gets his Cameron on, imagining his own Avatar-type uh, franchise. But it's not going to take as long as Avatar to get sequels because parts one and two for Costner's Westerns, they come out back to back in the summer, just two months apart. And another bold experiment for Hollywood as they try to lure audiences back to the theater post-pandemic. I actually think this is a really cool idea. The fact that at the beginning of the summer and then at the end of the summer, you'll be able to experience this Western. I like this a lot. And it's particularly because Kevin Costner is excellent at making Westerns. He's made some incredible Westerns. He's actually a really strong filmmaker. And his fandom has only grown thanks to Yellowstone. So this could be really big. The movie has to be amazing. But with Kevin Costner, I think that's quite possible. And how about Bong Joon-ho? This is, this is complicated. The Oscar winner is making his follow-up film for Warner Brothers, a sci-fi movie about cloning starring not just Robert Pattinson, but Steven Yeun. However, while he certainly has his fans and his accolades, Bong Joon-ho ain't what you'd call commercial, which is maybe why Warner Brothers decided to take Mickey 17 off of its March release date, which is a very commercial release date. Again, that's the spring break corridor. Maybe they're trying to find a more awards-friendly release date? Some fans freaked out and thought that Zazie might be trying to dispose of another body, but you can't do that to Bong Joon-ho, can you? I mean, it's a Bong Joon-ho movie starring Robert Pattinson and Steven Yeun. People are going to be interested in it. Uh, and these days, bringing up the rear is M. Night Shyamalan, passing Christopher Nolan as he goes from Universal to Warner Brothers, ships in the night. Although, uh, based on the recent box office numbers for Shyamalan's last few movies, I don't think Universal is too sad to see him go. 
Uh, interestingly, he's supposedly delivering two movies for Warner Brothers in 2024, which are now both set for summer. Two M. Night movies, months apart, that aren't, are they related to? I mean, you can't do it with more than one thing. It's, gotta, it's just got to be Costner's gimmick. Finally, Barry Levinson. He is a Hollywood legend who has definitely lost his touch the last couple of years. But on this one, he has Robert De Niro playing two roles, dueling mob bosses based on real life crime figure, figures, Vito Genovese and Frank Costello. How often can Robert De Niro keep going back to the gangster well? I'm not tired of it yet, are you? And him playing two roles like uh, Tom Hardy did when he played two gangsters actually, interestingly enough, two real life gangsters as well. I think there could be something here. I like this, I'm interested in it. Even though again, Barry Levinson has a horrible track record of late. I'm like, two Robert De Niro's? I'm in. It's also worth noting that Warner Brothers will release several films strictly overseas in 2024. They're the international distributors for MGM's Challengers, Universal's Twisters, and Amazon's uh, Amazon, you know, the, the, their uh, Dwayne Johnson Christmas movie, Red One. So Warner Brothers will participate in some of that overseas revenue as well uh, for their bottom line. And, you know, revenue, overseas revenue these days can be quite healthy. So that's the state of Warner Brothers Discovery in 2024. What do you think of their slate? Uh, as I said, I think it's not only pretty solid, it might actually be strong. And I appreciate some of the risks that they're taking here. And I'm very excited about a lot of it. I mean, I don't know if it's all gonna work, but I'm certainly interested to see what happens. And I, again, I, I applaud them for taking the risk. So uh, also, what do you think of Warner Brothers being potentially sold yet again? Uh, once Zazzy is done with it, will there be any of the, uh, the historic iconic, we're talking about legacy and uh, iconicness, will any of that be, of Warner Brothers be left? You know, that was really lost to Fox, which was quite sad. But Warner Brothers is even more historic and has very much been one of those studios that has a personality. I can still see it as of right now. I still think that personality is there, but I do worry what will happen once it gets you know, diluted with Paramount. Paramount doesn't really have a legacy. Paramount, Paramount and Fox are kind of more on the same level. Uh, I think that Disney and Warner Brothers and Universal have, I think, real personalities. Uh, we'll see, you know, that's something that's being lost with all these mergers and acquisitions. All right, so, uh, uh, Netflix start, I don't know. They're saying Netflix started it all, but you know, everybody's suffering financially. As I've said many times, when Bob Iger pulled all the studios into the digital world with the launch of Disney Plus, it really, did, it really was a Pandora's box. All right, share your thoughts down below, subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.